Happy Monday, Discovery Learners! It is I, Teacher Liz, here with another episode of Ability to Learn from the Discovery Day program. Today, I'll be sharing with you some cool observances, interesting history, cool facts, cool animals, and plants. And let's not forget, there's a new Spanish word to learn and a new place to explore this week. And also, don't forget to log in every day to the live Zoom sessions provided every day by the Discovery Educational Team. Now let's not delay any further, let's start the show. And now for today's observances. Happy Monday, Discovery Learners! It's I, Teacher Liz here, bringing you a new episode of Ability to Learn for today, Monday, November 15th, 2021. And of course, our first observance for today is National Bunt Day. Mmm, Bunt Cake. National Bunt Day, also known as National Bunt Cake Day, is observed every year on November 15th. As people across the United States plan menus for the holidays, a bundt cake is sure to be on that list at least once. A bundt cake can be a cake baked in a bundt pan. That's B-U-N-D-T, bundt. Forming it into a distinctive ring shape, the mold of the bundt pan is initially inspired by the traditional European fruit cake, known as Gujo Huha. It was in the 1950s and 60s that the cookware company named Nordicware popularized the style for the modern design and trademarked the name Bunt. Nordicware started producing Bunt pans made from cast aluminum. Similar pans are sold as fluted tube pans or other similar names. Due to the difficulty of frosting a ring shaped cake, Bunt cakes are typically served undecorated, glazed, or dusted with powdered sugar. In the beginning, when the Bunt pan first came out, it didn't sell well, and Nordicware considered discontinuing the product. Then in 1963, Good Housing Cookbook, the Bunt cake pan was mentioned, and sales increased. And in 1966, sales increased dramatically when a bun cake called the Tunnel of Fudge, baked by Ella Henfrich, took second place at the annual Pillsbury Bake Off and winning a $5,000 prize. The publicity from the Bake Off resulted in more than 200,000 bun pan sales. So, how do we observe National Bun Cake Day? Well, get out your bun pan and make a cake. It's that easy. There are oh so many different cakes to make using a bun pan, and they come out beautiful too. You just can't go wrong. So have you ever baked in a bun pan? And if you have, did you like it? <laughs> go ahead and let us know in the comment section below. Our next observance is a helpful one. It's National Philanthropy Day. On November 15th, National Philanthropy Day honors those who give back to their communities. The word philanthropy comes from the Latin and Greek philanthropa, which gives us kindness, humanity, and love for mankind. From this, we take philo, which means tending to or fond of, and joins anthropos, meaning mankind or human beings. Philanthropists give their time and money in ways that provide a lasting impact. Here are just a few examples of philanthropy. Supporting education through scholarships, grants, foundations, and more. Foundations support scientific research, development of charities, funding grants for programs for local, national, and international needs, encourage art through grants and foundations, or investing in advocacy platforms for the underprivileged. The day recognizes philanthropists for their many significant contributions, help, and good deeds for the differences that they have made in our lives and our communities. While philanthropy is giving in kind, it is a type of gift that strives to replace social ills with solutions. Philanthropist sees issues and tries to solve them. Charity is often a temporary solution for a temporary problem. When the issue persists, we seek a cure. So how do we observe National Philanthropy Day? Well, you can learn more about the different kinds of philanthropy in your community or volunteer at a local organization that contributes philanthropy in your community. And this is good timing too with the holidays coming up. So what do you plan to do for Philanthropy Day? 
Go ahead and share your thoughts in the comment section below. Our next observance is National Clean Out Your Refrigerator Day. Oh boy, I need to do this myself, actually. National Clean Out Your Refrigerator Day on November 15th encourages us to prepare for upcoming holidays. And boy, does it. Get together soap in a hot water-filled bucket, disinfectant, a sponge, and a garbage bag. Then you'll be ready for the day. With family gathering, a large turkey waiting to be roasted, cleaning out the refrigerator just makes sense. Not only will we need room before the meals, but we will also need space for all the upcoming leftovers. Many dread this job. However, it is an important task nonetheless. Due to our hectic busy lifestyles, the cleaning of the refrigerator gets neglected. Hence the creation of National Clean Out Your Refrigerator Day. There may be a surprise or two found in the back of the shelves. Things are often pushed back as the new food are put in the front and the old ones get forgotten and rotten. Ew, yuck. According to the Sanitation Foundation International, they found that the meat and vegetable drawers are the dirtiest spots in our kitchens. Well, with regards to causing disease, oh boy. However, those who clean their fridges more often tend to waste more food. There's plenty of advice available on frequency of fridge cleaning. Understanding food labels and meanings behind sell-by and best-by dates are also important. These labels don't necessarily mean a product has gone bad, but that the quality is best by the date on the label. However, the use by on the label leaves some of us wondering. So how do we observe clean out your refrigerator day? Some suggestions for your refrigerator cleaning are empty each shelf, completely wipe down the inside of the refrigerator, wash drawers and underneath the drawers, throw away all expired food, and throw away all moldy food. Get rid of anything that you do not use anymore. You can also vacuum out under the refrigerator and then restock the shelves and drawers with good new food. Enjoy your nice clean refrigerator. You earned it. And for our last observance for today is National Raisin Bran Cereal Day. Oh my goodness, I love Raisin Bran. Yes, on National Raisin Brown Cereal Day on November 15th, pours us a bowl of one of the country's go-to cereals. Made from toasted oat or wheat flakes with plump raisins added, these cereals have been a staple in many American breakfasts for generations. Since 1925, a variety of companies have been producing Raisin Bran cereal. Those companies include Kellogg's Raisin Bran, General Mills, Total Raisin Bran, U.S. Mills, and Raoul Corp. Post Raisin Bran. But the first company was U.S. Mills. In 1925, Skinner's Manufacturing Company based out of Omaha, Nebraska introduced to the United States the Skinner's Raisin Bran. While other bran cereals existed, Skinner's debuted the first with raisins included. For several years, Skinner's held the exclusive rights to the name Raisin Bran. But that did not stop others from making their own cereal with raisins in it. Skinner's Manufacturing Company had been in business since 1918. And as the country's largest producer of bran and wheat products, they were not going to let this go without a fight. They took their trademark to court. Despite being the first and trademark in the name, Skinner's lost on the grounds that the words Raisin Bran are merely ingredients. So how do we observe National Raisin Bran Cereal Day? Well, since Raisin Bran is the star of the day, enjoy it as a snack or for breakfast. If you're not a big fan of bran, you can always separate the raisins. Or maybe you're not a raisin fan. Oh well, but take this as a consolation. Here's today's interesting fact. Did you know that you could make wine from raisins? <laughs> it's true. So now you can have your bran and wine too. <laughs> so do you like raisin bran? Go ahead and let us know in the comment section below and comment down below and let us know how you plan on observing, well, these observances for today. On this day in history. Today, in 1904, King C. Gillette patents the Gillette razor blade. King Camp Gillette was an American businessman. 
he invented a best-selling version of the safety razor. Several models were existence before Gillette's design. Gillette's innovation was thin, inexpensive, disposable blade of stamped steel. Gillette is also erroneously credited with inventing the so-called razor and blades business model, in which razors are sold cheaply to increase the market for blades. However, Gillette's safety razor company adopted the business model from its competitors. While working as a salesman for the Crown Cork and Seal Company in the 1890s, Gillette sold bottle caps, but the cork seal he sold thrown away after the bottle was opened. This made him recognize the value of basing a business on a product that was used a few times and then discarded. Men shaved with a straight razor that needed sharpening every day using a leather strap. As existing relatively expensive razor blades dulled quickly and needed continuous sharpening. A razor whose blade could be thrown away when it was dulled would meet a real need and likely be profitable. Hence the razor blade he patented. Go ahead and leave a comment below and let us know what you think of today's historical events. Notable figures born on this day. Our first notable figure born today is Georgia O'Keeffe, born November 15, 1887, in Sun Prairie, Wisconsin. This American modernist artist, who was best known for her paintings of flowers and western landscapes, including summer days. She was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1977 by President Gerald R. Ford and the National Medal of Arts in 1985. Before she was famous, she decided to become an artist at the age of 10 and began studying with local watercolorist Sarah Mann. Her breakthrough came in 1916 when Anita Pulitzer showed Alfred Seiglitz of the 291 Gallery her charcoal drawings. He loved them so much, he decided to show them. She unfortunately passed away March 6th of 1986 at the age of 98. But an interesting piece of trivia to know about her is her 1946 exhibition at New York Museum of Modern Art was the first retrospective held for a female artist. Wow! Happy birthday, Georgia O'Keeffe! Our next notable figure born today is Ed Asner, born November 15, 1929, in Kansas City, Kansas. This American actor and comedian played Lou Grant on the Mary Tyler Moore Show and gained prominence as a political activist. He also became the president of the Screen Actors Guild. Before he was famous, he attended University of Chicago and served in the U.S. Signal Corps. He unfortunately passed away this year, in August 29, at the age of 91. But an interesting piece of trivia to know about him is, he was the voice of Carl Fredrickson in Pixar's Up. Oh wow, I like that movie. Happy birthday, Ed Asner. Another notable figure born today is... Grandy Savage, born November 15, 1952, in Columbus, Ohio. This American wrestler, also known as Macho Man Randy Savage, starred in the World Wrestling Federation and World Championship Wrestling and World Champion Wrestling fights in the 1980s and 90s. Before he was famous, he was signed by the St. Louis Cardinals in the MLB out of high school. He unfortunately passed away May 20th of 2011 at the age of 58. But an interesting piece of trivia to know about him is, he won the 1987 WWF King of the Ring Championship and the 1995 WCW World War III Championship. Wow! Happy birthday, Randy Savage! Another notable figure born today is E-40. Born November 15, 1967, 
in Vallejo, California. This American pioneering Bay Area rapper gave rise to the West Coast sound and made Oakland a hub of rap culture. He had his biggest commercial success in 2006 with the single Tell Me When To Go. Before he was famous, he was a member of the Bay Area hip-hop group The Click before making his solo debut in 1993. He turns 54 years old today. Wow, happy birthday E40. And our last notable figure born today is Chad Kroger, born November 15, 1974 in Hannah, Canada. This Canadian singer and guitarist is best known as the frontman for Nickelback, known for singles like How You Remind Me and Photograph. Before he was famous, he was in a grunge cover band before forming Nickelback in 1990s. He turns... 47 years old today. Wow, happy birthday, Chad Kroger. Happy birthday, everyone. Come along, Discovery Learners, as we explore a new place of the week. This week, we are traveling to... Bosnia. And you hear that song in the background, Discovery Learners? Well, of course, that's the Bosnia National Anthem. Now as you give that a listen to, let's learn a little more about the Bosnian flag. This nation's flag consists of a blue field, divided by a large yellow triangle and a diagonal line of white stars. The stars at the top and the bottom are cut off by the edges of the flag. The current iteration of Bosnia's flag has been in use since February 4, 1998. Bosnia is an ethnically mixed country, so the colors and the symbols of the flag aren't linked to a single ethnic, religious, or political group. So together as a whole, the mixed flag with different shapes and colors represents the country. Pretty interesting, Bosnia! Now let's learn a little more about the country. Bosnia is located in southeastern Europe, with Slovenia and Croatia to the west and northwest, Montenegro, Kosovo, and Serbia to the east and northeast, Hungary to the north, and the Adriatic Sea to the south. Bosnia's official name is Republika Bosnia, which means Republic of Bosnia. Its head of government is a prime minister, and its head of state is a president. Its form of government is an emerging republic with two legislative houses, the House of Peoples and the House of Representatives. The capital of Bosnia is Sarajevo, and its official language is Bosnian, with Croatian and Serbian at a close second. The current population of Bosnia is 3,481,000 people. The most popular religion in Bosnia is Islam, followed by Orthodox Christianity and Roman Catholic. The total area of Bosnia is 19,772 square miles. That's a little bit smaller than the U.S. state of South Carolina. The main monetary unit for Bosnia is the convertible marka. Two Bosnian convertible markas equals one U.S. dollar. The main exports for Bosnia are car seats, electric items, processed wood, aluminum, and wooden furniture. Wow, Bosnia seems like a really interesting place. I don't know much about it, but I can't wait to learn more. So be sure you stay tuned all week long to Ability to Learn as we teach you more about Bosnia. Wow, now that's a really interesting place of the week. Here is the animal of the day. Hey Discovery Learners, today's animal is the yellow-bellied marmot. That's quite a mouthful, but it's actually a very interesting animal. 
The yellow-bellied marmot is a type of large ground squirrel. These animals can be found in different parts of the southwest Canada and western parts of the United States. The yellow-bellied marmot prefers open habitats such as edges of the forests, alpine meadows, and pastures. They like to live in high altitudes, all the way up to 13,450 feet. And luckily, because they're so high up, they're not endangered. The yellow-bellied marmot reaches 14.3 to 19.7 inches in length from head to tail and can weigh from 3.3 pounds all the way up to 11 pounds. They have a tail that's 4 to 8 inches in length. That means they're mostly tail. The fur of the yellow-bellied marmot is yellowish and brown in color. They have yellow patches on the side of their neck and their fur is reddish to yellow color on their underside. Hence, yellow-bellied marmot. They also have short little muzzles and small ears that are covered with fur. The yellow-bellied marmot can't see very well either. Because it's short-sighted, but has excellent sense of smell and hearing, the last two senses allow it to find food and stay away from predators very easily. The yellow-bellied marmot is also a daytime animal, which means it's up during the day and runs around on the ground, but it's also able to climb high trees and shrubs as well. And surprisingly, unlike most squirrels, the yellow-bellied marmot is a vegetarian. Its diet consists of grass, flowers, seeds, and herbs. The yellow-bellied marmot dig complex systems of burrows which contain several entrances, tunnels and emergency exits which are used as shelter from predators and a den for hibernation, and the breeding of their young. Their burrows are usually 3.3 feet deep but they can reach as deep as 23 feet when they build up for hibernation. They also live in tight groups, usually consisting of one male and two to three females. Sometimes these small groups gather and form large colonies. The males are territorial. They use a special type of secretion of facial glands to mark their territory by rubbing the secretion on the borders of their burrows. Unlike aggressive behavior typical for males, females are usually very kind to one another. The yellow belly marmot is also known as a whistle pig because it produces a high-pitched sound like a whistle as an alert to the other members of the group when there's a predator detected. The main predator for these little guys are foxes, coyotes, and wolves. Depending on the altitude in which they inhabit and the length of the cold period, they hibernate six or more months each year. During hibernation, their metabolic and heart rate decrease, and they burn the body fats collected during the summer to gain energy required for survival. The yellow belly marmot is not a true hibernator, it wakes up from time to time. The breeding season for the yellow belly marmot takes place after emerging from hibernation. The pregnancy lasts only 30 days and ends with 3 to 8 babies. The females will give birth to a nest that they've coated with grass. Young yellow belly marmots leave the nest for the first time after 3 weeks. Babies drink their mother's milk for the first five weeks, and after two years, they're able to have their own babies. The yellow belly marmot can live up to 15 years in the wild. That's an old little squirrel. So what do you think of today's animal? Is it cute? Is it creepy? Go ahead and let us know what you think in the comment section below. The plant of the day. Hey, Discovery Learners. Today's plant is the beetroot. The beetroot is a herbaceous plant. The plant originates from India and Mediterranean areas and the Atlantic coast of Europe, but it can be found all over the world today. The beetroot is cultivated mainly because of its high nutritional value. Chemical compounds isolated from the beetroot are used in medicine, chemicals in the food industry. In 800 BC, the beetroot was used for ornamental purposes. The beetroot develops a leafy stem that can grow 39 to 78 inches in height. The beetroot has a heart-shaped leaf that usually have 2 to 8 inches long in the wild. The plants are much longer in cultivated varieties. Most people cultivate beetroot because of its edible root. It develops 55 to 65 days after planting the seed. The root is usually red to purple in color. Unlike other types of vegetables, the root contains high quantities of sugar. The beetroot develops small, green, or reddish flowers that appear in dense spikes. The flowers are pollinated by the wind. The fruit of the beetroot is called nutlet. It has a hard structure and it's arranged in small clusters. That's interesting. I didn't know that beets had fruit. Beetroot has a high nutritional value. Besides its high content of sugar, beetroot is a rich source of vitamin B6 and B9, and other minerals like iron, magnesium, and potassium. The root can be used raw, cooked, or pickled. It's often used in salads, soups, and an ingredient in small dishes made of meat. Beetroot can also be used in the manufacture of wine. I've had beet wine. It's not that great. The leaves of the beetroot are also edible. Fresh leaves taste like spinach. The leaves of the beetroot were used for binding wounds in ancient Greece. 
Beetroot was a very popular mouth freshener in the past as well. It was used to eliminate the smell of garlic. The latest medicinal experiments show that the beetroot lowers blood pressure and increases endurance in athletes. It also prevents the development of liver disease, which results as a protein deficiency, diabetes, or alcohol abuse. Beet juice was also used as a dye in the past. During the 19th century, women used to use beetroot for dyeing their hair. The substance isolated from the beetroot is responsible for the purple color of the root. The substance is used in the food industry to improve the color and taste of desserts, such as jams, ice cream, jellies, tomato sauce, and even breakfast cereals. Homemade lotions produced by boiling the beetroot can be used from the removal of dandruff. Juices made of beetroot can be used to test the acidity of waters. It'll turn pink in an acid solution and yellow in an alkaline solution. The beetroot is actually an aphrodisiac. The beetroot is a biennial plant, which means that it finishes its life cycle in two years. That's super interesting. I'm a big fan of beets. I like to eat pickled beets. How about you? It's that time again. We just learned about a new plant. So go ahead and tell us what you think in the comment section below. The word of the day. Today's word is urgency. It is spelled U-R-G-E-N-C-Y. It's a noun. It means Importance requiring swift action. An earnest and persistent quality. Insistence. Urgency. Our next word is a word you may have heard somewhere in today's episode. That word is philanthropy. It's a noun. It means the desire to promote the welfare of others expressed especially by generous donation of money to good causes. Philanthropy. Hola, Discovery Learners. So y'all, do my extra Liz. Hi, Discovery Learners. It is I, your teacher, Liz. Aquí es su palabra en español de la semana. What that means is, here is your Spanish word of the week. La parábola para esta semana es cocina, 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 which means kitchen, cocina, kitchen, cocina, kitchen, cocina. You can use this word in a phrase. Él está haciendo la cena en la cocina. 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 Which means, he is making dinner in the kitchen. Él está haciendo la cena en la cocina. He is making dinner in the kitchen. Él está haciendo la cena en la cocina. Go ahead and practice speaking Spanish all week long by saying, Él está haciendo la cena en la cocina, which means he is making dinner in the kitchen. ¿Cómo se dice kitchen en español? Cocina. Sí, muy bien. Hasta la semana que viene, Discovery Learners. Be sure to tune in next Monday to learn another Spanish word of the week here on Ability to Learn. Hey Discovery Learners, it's me Andrew Lancaster here with a fun new list of movies to watch this week. Our first recommendation is Remember the Titans. This 2000 film is rated PG. It's a sports drama with a two hour runtime. It stars Ethan Suppley, Ryan Gosling, Hayden Pantaneri, and Denzel Washington, and is available on Disney Plus. Our next movie is the Fantastic Mr. Fox. This 2009 family comedy has a rating of PG and a 1 hour and 27 minute runtime. It stars George Clooney, Bill Murray, Meryl Streep, Owen Wilson, and Willem Dafoe. And you can find it on Disney Plus. 
Up next is Spirit. This 2002 family adventure film has a rating of G and a 1 hour and 24 minute runtime. It stars Matt Damon and James Cromwell, and it's free to watch on Peacock. This week's cinematic work of art is... The Indian in the Cupboard. This 1995 family drama has a rating of PG, a 1 hour and 38 minute runtime, and was directed by Frank Oz. The music is by Randy Eldeman. It stars Hal Scardino, Richard Jenkins, Lindsay Corse, David Keith as Boone, and Lightfoot as Little Bear. The Indian in the Cupboard. The Indian in the Cupboard. What an amazing film. They used a ton of different CGI techniques from using a green screen to force perspective, even stop motion animation, using all those different techniques and ways to trick the viewer into thinking that Little Bear was actually a toy that had come to life, that even all these years later, the special effects still kind of hold up. They also chose an amazing cast, and with the help of the use of sound techniques when showcasing them as toys, to great effect. They also use some wonderful sound techniques. By filming the close-up shot of the toys, they used giant sound stages, which allowed for echoes, making what would seem like a small space to us, like a two-foot cupboard, seem massive in comparison to this small toy that's come to life. Not many films pay that close attention to details. The score wasn't what made the film work, but the actor's storytelling ability and the scenery shine, making this motion picture a cinematic work of art. Now playing at the Discovery Theater this Friday, starting at 1 p.m. Aww, we all know what that song means. It means we reached the end of today's episode of Ability to Learn. I had fun, and I hope you had fun too. But not only had fun, I hope you learned something as well. Don't forget to click like, subscribe, or to hit that bell icon so you'll be notified about all the fun we're having at Ability to Learn from the Discovery Day Program. This is Teacher Liz signing out. Farewell, Discovery Learners. I will see you next time.